So, uh, you know, thanks very much for inviting me. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you guys. Um, I think that anytime somebody comes to talk to you about robots, uh, ethics, or law around robots, you should start from a point of skepticism, right? I mean, you know, why are we talking about robots, right? Uh, and so, a lot of the times, discussions about robot ethics and robot law. Um, involves things like, you know, when robots are self-aware, well, they have rights, or are Asimov's, you know, this fictitious set of, uh, of uh, robot laws adequate to deal with, you know, robot autonomy. Um, and, you know, that's probably not, in the short term, a very interesting question. Uh, we've been doing uh, artificial intelligence in the United States, at least since it was, um, the term was coined in my alma mater uh, in, uh, in the 50s. Um, and we've been doing it for all this time, and you know, today computers and artificial intelligence are about as smart as insects. So the idea that anytime soon we're going to have, you know, autonomous or really, really smart robots is not at all likely. Um, and so my work is actually on the immediate commercial prospects and effects of robots, like that is in the near, near term. Um, and what I want to convince you of initially is that this is an important uh, uh, area. So today my talk is going to be about various ways in which different kinds of robots um, actually implicate privacy. Um, you know, one thing I do want to assure you of though is that robots are increasingly going to be part of the mainstream. Okay, so there was an op-ed by Bill Gates a couple years ago called Robot in Every Home where he opined that we are at the point today with personal robotics that we were in the late 70s uh, with personal computing. Um, there are uh, forecasters uh, who, who, for a living, determine the size of an industry. Uh, they forecast that personal and service robots, so that's not military robots, it's not factory robots, but like literally robots like the Roomba, the vacuum cleaner in your house, and other kinds of things like that, will be a $5 billion industry within the next few years. Subsequent iterations have, and so just to give you a sense of perspective, sometimes you throw out numbers like, what does that mean? Uh, yoga, that you probably have heard of, is a six billion dollar industry. Okay, so you know, this could be something that is really, really big, and that, and that you know, really, that the signs are all that, that it will be. Um, and again, just in the next uh, in the next few years. Um, so, and that's setting aside, incidentally, the fact that robots are widely used in manufacturing. They're widely used in the theater of war, I and mean, we are using more and more robotics in, in battlefields uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq, etc. Um, and, and more on the way. Um, so, also another question in your mind ought to be sort of something like, what is a robot? Like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, why, you know, is that a special thing? Is it just a machine? You know, how is a, is a dishwasher a robot? You know, what, what are you talking about here? Um, and uh, I, want to, I want to sort of crib from a definition um, from Peter Singer's work. He wrote Wired for War. Um, if you're interested in the field of robotics, I, I highly recommend Wired for War by uh, P.W. Singer. Um, and his definition involves that a robot has to have three essential elements, uh, and those are uh, sensors, a processor, and an actuator. So, what are those things, and why? So, a sensor is because it can't just be a term; it can't just be a dumb terminal. It's got to be something that actually takes the world in. It has to have a sensor of some kind, radar, video, often. You know, I, but there's a whole range of potential sensors: MRI. Sonar, all laser guides, laser finders, all kinds of different possibilities. But it has to have a, a way of seeing the world. Um, processor, because it has to actually have, notwithstanding my crack about the fact that they're as smart as insects, I mean, it has to have some onboard processing capability. Otherwise, you would think of a um, remote control car with a little camera on it as a robot. But we don't really think of that as a robot, actually. We think of that as just a little remote control vehicle with a sensor. Um, and so it has to have some processing capability on board. Um, what an interesting example is the Mars rover. So the Mars is so you know far away that um, even though technically the Mars rover is controlled here in, you know uh, on Earth, um, in fact uh, it's so far away that you have to actually send a set of commands that then the Mars rover has to interpret. So it has to it has to have onboard processing capability so that it doesn't drive off of cliffs or you know or, or it's able to piece together things over time. So, um, and an actuator, because otherwise your laptop with a camera on it or your iPhone or something like that is going to be a robot without the ability, because it has a processor and a sensor. So an actuator is also very important. It has to be able to act on the world. 
Um, and I argue in another paper, the one that you mentioned over robotics, that ends up being a really interesting difference between computers and robots for purposes of liability. Because you know, computers can do all kinds of great stuff, but if something goes wrong, if Word freezes and you lose your term paper, you can't really sue Intel or Word, right? But if software can touch you, uh, and there's a glitch, and there's a physical ramification, then often the courts will respond very differently. Um, but if that's the definition of, uh, of a robot, it, then uh, it's not hard to see why robots would raise privacy concerns, almost by definition, right? They, they can move around and see things, process, and um, those are the component parts. Um, and the purpose of this talk, which is uh, from a book chapter in MIT Press called Robots and Privacy, and <coughs> book is called um, uh, Robo, Robot Ethics, um, the Social and Legal Ramifications of Robotics, something like that. It's coming out soon from MIT Press. Um, the purpose of it is basically an issue spotting exercise. That is, I'm going to talk about three different ways in which robots implicate uh, privacy. Um, and I'm going to try to do it in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> so we have time for discussion. Um, so the first major way in which robots, and you know, this is everything from robots in your house, in your office, telepresence, drones, everything else implicate uh, privacy, is that they actually greatly facilitate direct, surve direct surveillance. They make observing easier. And in fact, outside of factories, one of the chief ways that robots are used today are for surveillance. Battlefield surveillance, intelligence, that kind of thing. Um, increasingly, incidentally, it's being used on the domestic front, starting with border control, but there are also pilot programs um, in cities where uh, uh, law enforcement are using uh, drones and the like. Um, why is it interesting to think about a robot as distinct from, say, a camera? Um, well, it's just a variety of designs that you see going to robotics. Again, because the primary purpose of robotics is to facilitate observation, um, you see some really incredible things that differ, I think, in quality and uh, certainly in quantity from what you have before. Um, one is the ability to have drones that are, and these, air, these are unmanned aerial aircraft, I think you all understand what I mean by, by drones, um, to have very, very large uh, semi-autonomous machines that are very, very, very far away and have high, you know, really good cameras, almost like satellites, except for, for a smaller regional area and able to be, to be moved around more easily. Um, there, are, there are drones today that can be thousands of miles up and impossible to see with the eye, so you can sort of get this great rhythm. Um, they're, and they can stay up and suddenly for you know, days uh, without having to come down and, and engage in the surveillance. Um, but then perhaps more interesting are um, really, really small. So, so one of them is large and far away. What about like, really, really small and close robotics? And so there are robots <coughs> under development um, under DARPA funding, um, you know, this is advanced defense uh, research funding, um, that are actually um, insects uh, that have been fitted with technology that permits uh, a, a camera and for the insect to be um, driven around. Okay, and this is, an, I, mean, I couldn't make this up, this is like a real thing where they're experimenting with taking like, a cockroach, putting a little camera on it, and being able to guide this thing around like a remote control. Um, there's also, the same thing has been thought about with sharks. Okay, and these again, this is because we want to see what's going on, we want to be able to do, to do this observation. Um, there's also uh, uh, robots that are, exist today in prototype um, that are so small that they can sort of fly up and perch on your windowsill and look into your house. And they can recharge by just perching on top of a, um, on top of a power line. Okay? Um, and, and, and there are many more examples. Another great example is um, uh, robots that are able to climb up the sides of high-rise buildings. And that's another... They're not, and, and they're not cleaning windows and stuff. They're <laughs> looking into <laughs> the, the building. Um, another really interesting thing that you might not have believed possible is there's actually shape-shifting robots under development. These are robots that's called jamming is the technique. And iRobot has a version, and there's a couple other research versions. This is actually building a robot that's made out of a pliable plastic substance. And by actually, by, by, by triggering certain motors and certain chemical reactions, you can cause the robot to get really small or to get really big. And the researchers that built it, built it on purpose so that it could fit through small spaces, like for instance, underneath a door. Um, in addition to physical techniques of, of observation that are being created, um, uh, there's also very interesting ideas around software. So for instance, in Korea, in South Korea, they are 
uh, programming, they're, they're building algorithms that permit robots to actually be more stealthy. That is, these are robots that have a program that if they're in a space with you, they know how to avoid you and make sure that they can see you and you know. Okay? So these are all basically just techniques that are being developed on purpose in order to make robots be better at direct surveillance. Now, I'm not saying as an ethical matter that surveillance is automatically bad. We use surveillance for all kinds of wonderful reasons. We use surveillance to make sure that our loved ones are okay, to make sure that our houses are secure, to make sure that we people aren't committing crimes. There's nothing intrinsically bad about surveillance, but there's a deep literature in privacy that suggests that excessive surveillance um, and can be problematic. It can make people feel overly observed. It can chill uh, freedom of association um, and invade our lives in various ways. And so robots have that possibility of implicating robots. Um, a second and distinct way, I would argue, in which uh, robots implicate privacy is by facilitating access uh, to historically private spaces. So what do I mean by that? Maybe the simplest example is to look at research on the University of Washington by Tamara Denning and Toyoshi Kono uh, that looks at commercially available robots today that are used for entertainment or in order to, to make sure nothing's happening in your house, like sort of for house you know, guarding kind of thing. It's like the, the Rovio and uh, other commercially available robots today that actually connect to the internet. So these robots are in your house and you can guide them around or you can set them to sort of look around autonomously and they can send feed video and audio over the internet so that you can control them from there and see what they're seeing and that kind of thing. program them from there. So what the Denning and, and uh, Kono team did was see whether or not they could hack into this the way you might be able to hack into someone's computer. And it was easier to do than a computer in many instances. And not only were the researchers able to gain control of the video feed and actually see what the robot was seeing and hear what the robot was hearing from way outside the house, right? this is like you know, from the internet or somewhere, they were able to identify especially what robot video and audio streams looked like so they could just pick them out uh, as they travel over the internet. And they were able to gain control over the robot um, so that they could go look at the to see the things that you might want to see with the robot. And they were even able to do interesting things like, um, you know, pick up the keys and drop them on a mail slot. You know what I mean? So if, you put, if someone drives up to your house, and maybe the worst they could do is if you had an internal camera system, which I don't know, I don't, I don't have that, um, but some people do, I guess, is to sort of see what's going on in there. These researchers were actually able to manipulate objects and to, they didn't use this key technique um, of dropping up the mail slot, but it's a pretty obvious one. They did is they actually were able to make a, uh, find a key, put it on a table, and take a photograph of it so that they could later then recreate the key. But a more simple example is drop it up the mail slot. Um, and so that's access by vulnerability. Incidentally, these are overlap sometimes. There was a really interesting case where um, uh, our surveillance drones were hacked by insurgents. So the insurgents were able to see on their laptops what our surveillance drones were supposed to be showing US soldiers. Okay, so there's an instance of surveillance and an access by vulnerability together. And so what I'm trying to say is that as uh, these robots go into historically private spaces, like your home or your office or your car, it introduces new possibilities for access. Another way that access occurs, by the way, it doesn't have to be because of um, bad security. You might think to yourself, like, well, Ryan, um, we'll just have better security. This is just a stupid thing, and we'll just have better security, and we'll have McAfee for robots, and we'll all be fine. Um, another thing I want to I want to push upon though is uh, is that a, a fundamental principle of constitutional law of Fourth Amendment so, uh, against some reasonable search and seizures and you know generally in privacy is that with sufficient process the government can always get at something. Okay, so for instance, you know how like those cars have an OnStar system that like you can hit the button and it's like hey hi it's OnStar how can I help you? People are aware of that generally. Where your cell phone that you have on your person. The FBI can, and in instances has, remotely turn those on so it can hear what's going on in a car without having to bug it. Um, they've also turned cell phones on remotely in order to be able to um, uh, listen in on people's conversations on their cell phone. Now, don't put on your tinfoil hat just yet, right? It requires a tremendous amount of process to do that. That is, you have to be able to go to a, a court and get the process. But I'll tell you, one of the places that is most protected under American constitutional law is the interior of the home. And what having a robot in your house might potentially allow, uh, if that robot has recorded data or is streaming the data in some way, um, is for government to 
not only be able to see and what the robot sees, but also be able to guide the robot around and, and, and look into things. You could, do a, you could execute a search warrant without having to physically enter the house, is the danger. Incremental loss of, of liberty, perhaps, uh, requires a, a process, um, although at the margins there's um, some question about, this is probably not interesting, but, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, but at the margins, there's some there's some arguments that says that certain kinds of data that streams over the internet doesn't require a warrant to get it, um, and so there's a question whether the Electronic Communications Privacy Act doesn't necessarily cover um, some of this kind of data. Um, again, not to be alarmist, but I'm just expressing a way in which privacy might um, be implicated by by these rules. Um, so. Maybe the third, though, and most interesting, um, and, and really in many ways um, most related to ethics or deep questions of ethics, um, that I will by and large avoid in the skirt. But, um, but anyway, that, that maybe the most meaningfully implicated, um, and, and actually maybe the most unique way in which robots implicate privacy, um, is because they have social meaning. So what do I mean by that? Robots tend to be heavily anthropomorphic, okay? They, they're, they're heavily anthropomorphic because that makes it easier for us to interact and engage with them, okay? So let me give you an example. Carnegie Mellon built this thing called a nurse bot. It's supposed to help the elderly take their pills and get them out of bed, things like that. Um, it gives instructions to, to uh, people in order to help them if they're in trouble. Uh, they built the original version, and it was all really boxy. It looked kind of like a robot. I mean, it really looked like a robot. It was like this, like, you know. and uh, it went around being like, you know, please take your pills or whatever, and uh, and and everybody ignored it. Nobody did what it said. Oh my God, what's going on here? So they went back to the drawing board, and they made it with eyes, and made a more realistic voice, and made it more anthropomorphic. And lo and behold, people started to respond to it. All of a sudden, why is that? Well. People will tell you it's because we're hardwired to react to social technology as though it were really a person, even when we know intellectually that it's not. So for instance, people will pay for coffee more on the honor system if there's a pair of eyes over the collection plate than if there are flowers. Uh, people cooperate with robots. People cooperate with computer programs that look like people. There is an unbelievable uh, program, uh, really a, a whole way of thinking here at Stanford University um, uh, in which Cliff Nass and Byron Leeds are instrumental called Computers and Social Actors Theory. I see some people nodding their heads. And all they do, and, and, and that's not all they do, but within Computers and Social Actors, study the way in which we react to anthropomorphic machines like robots. And by the way, it doesn't take eyes and voices to make you feel like it's a person. People name their Roombas. People take their Roombas on play dates because they think they're lonely. I don't know if people, people like watch Arrested Development, but you know, they, people feed their Roombas. Uh, you know, oh, he's hungry. You know, um, you know. So it doesn't take a lot. It just takes some amount of intentionality, some amount of, uh, of indicia that looks like it might be uh, a, really a person. So why does this matter? Well, one of the chief things that privacy seeks to protect is time alone solitude, what Alan Weston said, moments off stage, right? Time when you're not in the presence of others, where other people's opinions don't matter as much, where you can process, where you can be yourself, dance in your underwear kind of thing, right? I mean, so this is like a real value that, 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 that um, uh, 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 privacy is said to protect. You'd be hard pressed to find a dystopian novel uh, where privacy wasn't one of the mo most conspicuously lacking elements, right? So in Zemiatin's We, uh, the buildings are transparent. Famously, in 1984, uh, there's the, the screens that are constantly watching you. Uh, in a brave new world, uh, the thing that is most repeated in the conditioning that you get when you live in this universe, the thing that's told to you in your sleep the most times, if you really pay attention to the descriptions, is that being alone is terrible. There's a sense in which solitude is important to self-constituted development. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which even biologically, there's evidence that there are certain functions that people want to, and animals want to do away from others, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, if we start to introduce anthropomorphic machines like robots and voices on your GPS and uh, you know computer uh, you know, screen websites that aid that help you with a little a person present, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we have more and more social technology, because it is so engaging and, and fun and interesting and, and helpful. Um, 
I want to argue that it has the potential to erode solitude. That is, you may not have those moments off stage. You may not have that time in your office with the door closed, in your car, uh, in your home, where you don't experience the presence of another person because you have uh, a heavily anthropomorphic machine. And so, um, in a paper entitled People Can Be So Fake, uh, I argue at length that if you look, if you match up the values that privacy tries to protect and um, the trend towards more social anthropomorphic technology and interfaces, um, you have the potential to um, lessen opportunities for solitude. Um, another interesting social meaning aspect of robotics is B.J. Fogg argues this in, in calls it captology. Um, uh, computers are just as good as people as leveraging the kinds of techniques you might want to do to persuade. And computers are very good persuaders. That is, computers are able to use all the things that humans use in order to persuade someone of something. So computers can make promises, computers can flatter, and we buy it, we totally buy it. You know what I mean? Like a computer, the more social they are, the more it's like that. Um, you know, computers can, can get us to reveal more about ourselves by revealing about themselves. There are studies that show that, like, you know, just something like computers saying things like, um, you know, um, I was programmed in, you know, <laughs> 2002. How old are you? You know what I mean? Is actually far more effective at getting information out of people than just saying, how old are you? You know what I mean? And so there's, again, if you want to see more about this, you know, computers as, as, as persuaders is this work by B.J. Falk here, again, here in Stanford. Um, but although they can leverage many of the same important um, social techniques as, as people, uh, they also have other advantages over people. So for instance, robots and computers generally, they don't get tired. They have perfect memories. They don't get embarrassed. Okay. So in an age in which we have to worry about harsh interroga interrogation techniques, we might also need to worry, eventually, about robot interrogators. Now I know that sounds dystopian, but does it sound any more dystopian than um, holding people underwater? You know, so you know, there are dangers uh, in terms of giving people to give up information that flow from the ability of using anthropomorphic technology. And I want to say that has to do with the social meaning. Um, you might link it up with direct surveillance. That is, it does increase our capacity to observe. By observe, you also include interrogate. But I put it in this category because it leverages this unique social media. And then, sort of as we get to the more plausible to the less plausible, as time goes on here, I'll give you the least plausible, but, but in many ways the most interesting um, aspect of privacy in robotics, which is that I believe that robotics eventually will create an entirely new category of privacy that we might call settings privacy. So what do I mean by that? You have all kinds of appliances in your house that you set certain ways, your thermostat your um, dishwasher, your, your coffee machine. And nobody cares how you set those. Nobody cares. Ryan gets up at 7, and so he uh, you know, sets his coffee machine to go up at 7. Ryan, you know, Ryan's not environmentally friendly because he uses the uh, dryer uh, option on the washing machine because he doesn't want to wait for them to dry on their own. Um, you know, people don't really care that much about how you use appliances today. But to the extent that appliances have social meaning, you're going to have conversations with these things. That you're going to be using them for role play. And even at the margins, there's a, uh, an entire industry around sex that people are using these robotic dolls uh, for these kinds of purposes. Um, if you uh, have a robot to keep you company, um, all of a sudden, the ways in which you program the robot, the ways in which you set it, um, have a social meaning. That if they were to be recorded and escaped, they would, you know, I mean, what you do in your own private home with your robot and what you talk about and how you set it and to be, how you how you want your robot to be in your house. We'll read like the transcript of some psych, you know, of a psychologist or something like that. I mean these are very, very intimate personal uh, experiences that then get uh, recorded in some fashion. Um, and although I don't see that happening in the very near term, I see that as being eventually a very interesting thing. So, you know, what does that have to do with, with ethics? Well, I believe that the solutions to direct surveillance and access actually are basically the same as any other solutions. They have to do with, you, know, you use law, right? I mean, or, or policy. 
So for instance, if you're worried about the use of drones in surveillance, you make a policy that the, law, that the local police department may not use drones. You say all the reasons why they don't. Just like people don't like um, uh, uh, cameras on, uh, <coughs> stop, on stoplights, and they get rid of them. You know what I mean? You just do that. Um, you, know, you have manuals that guard, that sort of uh, uh, express the circumstances under which you can use very, very small or very, very invisible um, surveillance. Um, and, and I think we can probably handle that. Whether we will or not is an open question, but I, I can see policy and legal moves to help us domestically. Um, on access, well, if you're particularly worried about people getting in the interior of the home and circumventing very difficult uh, protections of the Constitution, um, then you just raise the bar. Uh, you say if it's a robot, then uh, if it's interior of the home, regardless of uh, whatever it is, then you have to have an even higher process, a super warrant, which is what we require for a wiretap, more than a warrant under the Constitution, more than probable cause. Um, if you're worried about vulnerability, you build robots uh, and computer systems to be more secure. Right? You encrypt. I mean, there, there are moves from a policy and legal perspective that permit us to uh, you know, help domesticate that space, help resolve that space. But with social meaning, that's not as obvious. Because the problems there have much more to do with the way that we feel about this technology. And we invite it into our lives. No one is foisting us on us some anthropomorphic robot, right? I mean, if you have something like that in your in your office or your car or your house or whatever it might be, it's because you have, you know, not only did no one force it on you, you paid good money for it, right? Um, and you might not appreciate the subtle ways in which it will affect you behaviorally, psychologically. Um, also, in instances, we want to interrupt solitude. That is one of the ways that robotics is being used, particularly in Japan today, is to deal with elder care and to make sure that people um, uh, feel like someone's around, and that's extremely important. So where's the line between companionship and interruption of solitude? Um, similarly with interrogation, uh, is it not an improvement over, um, you know, why, why, not why not perfect techniques of interrogation? Um, isn't it more humane to just have a really good question asker than it is to like use physical stress? Um, you know, it won't be as easy to sort of straightforward outlaw, and it won't be as easy to anticipate and deal with the way that we deal with other aspects of privacy. Um, and, and so, you know, basically I'm, I'm raising these as three interesting issues that robotics um, will, I think in the near term, or already does, uh, rot and raise. And I, and I want to uh, push you to think about, um, uh, you know, what are the best ways to um, navigate um, this difficult space because actually, you know, I'm, I'm although I'm putting on my, you know, I was trying to scare you about robots uh, today. Um, in fact, I am very supportive of robotics and I believe it is the next transformative technology. Um, I, I've written uh, a paper that suggests that we ought to immunize um, robot manufacturers in some instances in order to foster growth in the field. I organize National Robotics Week which is a celebration, essentially, of robotics. And we have a big flagship um, uh, program at Stanford in April that I encourage all of you to check out. We had thousands of people come last year, and, and uh, dozens and dozens of uh, manufacturers of robots. I think robots are going to be great. It's hard to uh, even think about a major problem uh, that the United States has had that robots haven't been either involved in fixing or could have averted. Now, that sounds like a really serious statement. Like, what the hell are you talking about? But if you think about it, like. Uh, the oil spill, right? It was iRobot robots that went down there to figure out what was going on and give us some clarity. Um, when you think about um, the mining accidents, well, there are robots under development by MIT that would be able to do many of the functions that miners do today down you know, in the trenches, which would not necessitate human beings going into dangerous places like that. Um, uh, there, and there are many other examples. I'm sorry, another example. When the, uh, the bomb didn't go off in Times Square, we went and explored that and, and started to defuse it using a robot. I mean, there are many, many, many examples. I think this is actually a wonderful potential technology. And that's what makes this so difficult and thorny a question is, you know, what if, though, it's used for these other purposes? Um, and so that's, uh, that's a little more than half an hour, and that's what I told that I should be using here. So um, 